Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, August 25th. I feel like we've been off a year and we only missed a week. <laughs> but welcome back. In the next, if it takes three classes, that's fine. If it goes faster, that's fine too. But in the next little bit, I'm going to be teaching on Romans 9, 10, and 11. This is Israel past, present, and future. And if you're thinking, wow, but I'm a Gentile, what does this have for me? I guarantee you, this relates to you. God's time clock is in relation to Israel. If you're interested in what's going on in your world and want to know God's plan, if you want to even know, is God faithful to the Jew? This is for you. Hopefully out of this, you will receive a lot that will bless you. Romans is filled with our doctrinal foundation. If you want to build, the most important step of building is to lay a good foundation. When you build on the sand, I don't care how well you build it, I don't care how ornate you make it, I don't care if you put everything into it, if you've built it on the sand, you say goodbye. Because the rain will come, the wind will come, and whoosh, it will go. But if you build on that solid, sure foundation, and I'm talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Hamashiach, our Messiah, then you've got that solid foundation. And with Him being your foundation, if it's a hovel, it turns beautiful. If it's a mansion, it's even prettier. <laughs> it's greater because of its foundation. So Question. may this bless you. What's the name of the class? Romans 9, 10, and 11, okay. Israel Good. past, present, and future. I've still got the sign in the sky, the rainbow up there. Oh, past. okay. Roger suddenly realized that he still has the sign in the sky, another sign in the sky, the rainbow. So he's quickly going to change that. If you're seeing that, don't let it throw you. <laughs> yes, we did the rainbow, but his canopy of protection is still over us even in this study. You can pass the word around, Lord willing, September 15th. That would be, we've got three Wednesdays in between, and then it would be the next one. I will go back to Genesis. We will start with Genesis. Stay tuned as to whether we are Zoom only or whether we've been able to open up and go back to uh, Emmanuel and Zoom. One way or the other, we will continue on. And I encourage you, even if you think, well, I've heard this before. I know the ABCs. I know the fundamentals. I know the beginning. I guarantee you, every time you go through scriptures that you think you've been there before, if you ask the Lord, he will open you to a new depth, a new meaning, a new truth, something that will bless you. I saw someone dear to my heart, I'm not going to name her and embarrass her, but going through a, a study yesterday that she admitted she's been through this many times before, that I literally saw it because I happened to be looking at her on Zoom when all of a sudden the eyes got big and da ding and it's like, Wow, I never saw this. I get this. That's what I hope will happen as the Lord lifts the Word of God off of the page. It is a living book. It is alive. It is powerful. It is life-changing. I don't care where you are and how many times you've been through something. Don't sell the Lord short. Now, get off my commercial and get back to this. And when we're coming into the book of Romans, we know the author of Romans is Shaol Paul. A very good Jewish boy, Jewish background, obviously believer in his Messiah and Savior, writing though to the Romans. Now, do, do, does that sound Jewish? <laughs> the Romans were Gentiles, but Paul, being the apostle to the Gentiles, had much to say to them. Does that mean that Paul had no interest in his own people? That he turned his back on his own people? That he was no longer, quote, Jewish, how do you stop what you're born? But, you know, the comment going out there was it that he had no interest that he turned his back on his own people. And we will see his heart's cry in the, these chapters. I'll tip my hand ahead and tell you right smack in the middle of, of these chapters that lay out to us Israel's past, present, and future. You hear his heart cry that he wishes all of Israel would be saved. The degree he wishes that to I love my Jewish people, but I don't know if I could say what he said. If you don't know what he said, you look up Romans 10 one on your own or find out next week because I don't think we'll get there. But I do expect within the three classes to definitely be able to cover this material. Paul is laying down the foundational doctrinal truths. 
He always wanted to go to Rome. He always wanted to, to meet them face to face. He has a whole list of names at the end of the book, of people that he wanted personally greeted. And yet it's strange because he never set foot in Rome prior to writing the book. And when he finally does make it to Rome, it's as a prisoner and he's not allowed the freedom to go. But had he not, had he been able to go and talk to them face to face, we might not have had the book of Romans in our scripture. And what a book that is. The foundation again of our faith laid down so clearly and perfectly with that Jewish foundation. Because we know it is not two separate books. You'll hear me again and again and again. It's not the Jewish side and the Christian side. It is one book. It's the continual story. What he builds on so much of it's the tenets in Judaism revealed in the original covenant brought out to us in his teachings. And many of them laid down here in Romans. He's going to deal with the problem of Jewish unbelief in this chapter, in, in these three chapters. He's going to deal heavily with Israel, and I'm thrilled that he did because it gives us that time clock also. We can see God's heartbeat, we can see where he's at, we can understand, and we can answer a very important question for ourselves on the other end of this study. Because if we're honest and if we're true and we look at the fact and we say, well, God had a plan with, with the Jews, but they didn't fulfill it, so God turned his back. Well, God has a plan for the church. Are they fulfilling it? If we're honest, ouch. I don't think we see it being filled in the way that it should be. Are there churches that are? Absolutely. Or were there Jewish people that were? Absolutely. But we'll see that faithfulness of God that he doesn't stop what he promised. He doesn't turn his back and he doesn't pull a promise back. The very fact he doesn't do it to Israel says he will not do it to the church. This is the character of our God. So if you need eternal security in your God because you are the midst of a body that is not doing what it should do either. If our church body on earth was really living the way we should be living, we would be such a testimony to the world, the difference of how we handle our problems, the same problems the world handles, but the difference, they would be running to us. I want what you have. How do I get in? They would be begging for it if we were really on fire like we should be. Now, I'm blank blanketing, you know, I'm talking as a whole. Individuals are, but I'm talking as a whole. And we're dealing with a whole. We're dealing with a whole nation of Israel. We're dealing with a whole body of Messiah. So be sure and understand that, the, the difference when, when it boils down to the individual. But what Paul's going to do, because he's dealing with Jewish unbelief, he's shown that keeping the law avails nothing. It doesn't give the Jewish people brownie points. I hear a lot of people say, oh, well, they're Jewish. They've got an in with God. Oh, we don't have to witness to them. They're, they'll be saved. They're God's chosen. They've got it made. No, no, no. How can I say no stronger? No. <laughs> hear my heart. Paul makes it very clear. They don't have it just because they're Jewish. That wouldn't even be fair and it wouldn't be right, not only to the Gentiles, but if anyone, anyone could be saved apart from the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, then it's not fair to him that he had to die because let him get in the other way and him not go through that. But this is what Paul's bringing out, is the law doesn't give them an advantage because man's inherently sinful. The law shows them that. That's what the law did. It showed them you're not holy enough for God. You don't meet the standard that God says. Both Jew and Gentile are saved by faith alone. Not faith and anything else. Faith alone. The work of salvation is in the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. It is not in anything man does. So, Many people look and it appears to them that God has rejected Israel then because Israel as a whole, as a nation, rejected her Messiah. So she didn't get with the plan. So God said, okay, done with Israel. Let's go to plan B. 
right? I should see head shaking. <laughs> no! <laughs> now, the nation had hoped Messiah would come. There are those in the nation still hoping for Messiah to come. They're looking for the Messiah to come to deliver them from their enemies. Back in the day when Yeshua did come, they were looking to be delivered from Rome. Rome was over them. They weren't free to do as they wanted, and they knew it. So they were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for the Messiah. But since the death and the resurrection of Messiah has taken place, has it guaranteed them that, okay, then all their problems are over? No. In fact, when Shaul Paul wrote to Rome, it was getting worse for the Jews. If we say, and I'm round figuring, but let's just say that, that Yeshua's ministry, earthly ministry, ended in 40 AD with ascension back into heaven. It was just prior to 40 AD, but just round figure. We're reading a book that was written at least 15, maybe almost close to 20 years after that. Okay, we're, we're, let's just round it off to 60 AD. I believe it was written more like 57, 58, 59, but let's just round it off to 60 AD. Does everybody know what happens in 70 AD? 70 AD. I, I see it from Rowena, but I can't hear you. <laughs> the temple was destroyed by Rome. Very good. The temple was destroyed by Rome. Now, does that sound like it was getting better for the Jews? Their temple, their place of meeting God, their place of worship, their place of going every week is gone. Do you know what they called a Jew in Jerusalem? Dead. Only, the only good Jew was a dead Jew, and if they were in Jerusalem, it was the end of their life. They fled for their lives. They go out, the diaspora has begun, and it's spread, and they are still out in the diaspora to this day, even though there is a return. It's minimal to what God will do. With this building, if it's going to be in 10 more years that the temple's destroyed at the hand of Rome, then you can see it's not getting better for the Jews. It's getting worse. The noose is getting tighter, and they're feeling it. People are looking, and they're saying, well, has God really rejected his people? And if, if so, then they're going to say, well, the rejection's their own fault. It's because they rejected first. But what becomes of God's promises if that's true? God made promises to Abraham to Yitzhak, to Yaakov, that's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God promised the nation certain things. Where does that all go? Where does Israel fit into God's program if he's turned to the Gentiles now and he's done with the nation? What happens to those promises? Are they still good? Are they of no value? Do we have a God who starts and stops? Where are we at? And furthermore, <laughs> Pam's got the answer, but we'll make you all wait on the cliffhanger. <laughs> Furthermore, a lot of the Jews were thinking that since Shaul Paul himself, who was raised in the Jewish traditions and all of that, since he's gone to preach to the Gentiles, that shows that even he's turning his back on his own people, that he may be as hostile, at worst, at best, indifferent toward his own Jewish brethren. And because Shaul Paul knows that's the rhetoric around. He's going to answer that head on and strong, as I've already hinted at, at the top of, of Romans chapter 10. He's going to share his heart's burden. He's going to share not just his heart burden, though, but he is going to share God's plan for Israel then and God's plan for Israel now. As we have all that in our background, now we go into chapter 9 and verse 1. I think for the most part today, I'm going to try to read it from the complete Jewish Bible to try to give you a little more of that Jewish flavor, but I'll flip back to New American where I need to for our understanding also. Shaul Paul speaking says, I am speaking the truth. I can just hear him defending himself. Hello, I'm telling the truth. You know, where's the Bible? Give me the Bible. Let me put my hand on the Bible and let me put, swear I'm telling the truth. Now, why is he starting out that way? Because he's got all of this pent up that he just wants to declare it. He is, he's uh, fervent about it. He's passionate about it. 
I'm speaking the truth. I want you to know this is truth. He is going to go so far in the first verse before we ever get off on this that he's going to make a triple oath. He's going to swear it in three ways. We're going to see that, the, that he says, I, Paul, my conscience, and the Holy Spirit. I see him pulling everything he can. Like I said, for us today, we'd say, give me the Bible. Let me put my hand on the Bible and let me raise my other hand and, and tell you, I'm swearing the truth to you. God, when he made an oath, had to raise the hand by himself because there was no greater to swear by. But Shaul Paul says, I'm speaking the truth as one who belongs to the Messiah. I do not lie. And also bearing witness in my conscience. There's your second. Governed by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. There's your third. I, Paul, my conscience and by the, the Holy Spirit. He had to put his conscience in there because people can say and they can be lying. We know, and I'm not picking on them because God loves them as much as the Jew, but we know the Arab world believes that a lie is fine. If it brings the end that you need to get and you need to do a lie to get there, that's fine. That's part of their culture. So Shaul Paul is saying, I'm not just speaking it with my mouth. This, I'm, I'm heart convinced, my whole conscience, my every part of my being, everything that makes me who I am, I'm standing by this. Furthermore, it's not just me and my conscience, it is very God himself in his spirit. The Ruach HaKodesh, who is bearing witness, who is bringing this truth. Wow, this is something very important that Paul is basically swearing by heaven now. Not just me, not just my conscience, but I can take this all away and I can pull heaven into this and say it's on the basis of the Spirit of God. What is he saying that's so important? Verse 2, my grief is so great, the pain in my heart so constant. If you've ever lived with a broken heart, you begin to know what Shaul Paul was feeling. He's saying that he has sorrow, unceasing grief. He has such pain. These are words that we use when we're mourning. And I don't mean good morning. I mean when we're mourning the loss of a loved one. Shaul Paul feels like his heart is being crushed by the death of his fellow Jewish people because they aren't in belief. They are lost, and this is crushed crushing him is continually crushing him his heart can hardly withstand the pain have you gone through a time of mourning in your life do you remember how yes. severe the grief is at first i remember it with my parents going home i remember thinking will there ever come a day that i don't cry again guess what it does come for any of you who are in mourning, it does. I know I'll see them again. I knew it then, but my heart was broken for the separation. Shaul Paul is feeling a, a, what would, could be a permanent separation. His heart is breaking. If he's breaking over this, this has got to be something important. He goes on and he says in verse 3, that I could wish myself actually under God's curse and separated from the Messiah. I was thinking that was in 10 right here is in the beginning of 9. 10 also expresses his heart's desire. But here we are in verse 3 he's saying if it were even possible. Now notice he said if. That implies that it is not possible. He cannot be separated from his Messiah. He can't be under God's curse. Now an unsaved person will look at that and say oh so God does curse people. It's God's fault then. That's not fair. He's not a fair God. No, the curse comes by your lack of belief in his truth. If you have an umbrella and you go out in the rain and you don't put your umbrella up and open it up and you get wet, whose fault is it? <laughs> it's your fault. God's given the umbrella. He's given the way to not have the curse soak you. But if you choose not to open up his umbrella, his gift of salvation, then you will get wet, and you can get wet to your death. You can catch your cold and you can die. That's what Shaul Paul is bringing out, that there is a curse when one is in rejection of God and his way. 
he could almost wish that, that that was him if it meant these that he so loves, that he's so mourning, would come to saving faith. That's an amazing amount of love. That reminds me of when Yeshua said, and it's recorded in Yochanan in John chapter 10, that no greater love has man than this, that he lays down his life for another. That's the kind of love we are talking about. And how do we know that we cannot be separated from this love? Well, let's take a sneak peek back because we're not going to read and study Romans in order from the beginning of chapter 1. So I want to take you just back one chapter. He's already laid this down. In fact, he just laid it down just prior in verses 35 to 39, almost the end. And then, in fact, is it the end? I think it is. I'm, I'm calling back chapter 8 here, and I think it ends in 39, doesn't it? It does. So the very last words, just before these words, are how he could say that it is not possible he would be separated from God's love. And that's what I want to read to you from a different version than I usually read. It's going to be from the, the Bible called The Message. Some people do not like The Message because it's very um, street easy language and it loses a lot of value and, and they don't like the way that some of it is. But sometimes I think we need to hear it in everyday simple young language just because sometimes we get so used to hearing it a different way that we lose some of that, that um, depth of meaning here. So he's saying that he cannot be separated from the love of God because of these verses. Starting with verse 35 out of the message, so what do you think? With God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son, is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? Hello? He sent us his very own son out of the glories of a perfect heaven down to the worst slime, yuck, sinful world. Wow. Who would dare tangle with God by messing with one of God's own chosen? Who would dare even point a finger? The one who died for us, who was raised to life for us, is in the presence of God at this very moment sticking up for us. He's our advocate. He's standing in that gap when Satan comes against you to the, the Father in heaven. Yeshua, Jesus is saying, uh, 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 I paid the price for that. That's washed away. Lost my place. Okay. Do you think anyone's going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? <laughs> Do you think? There's no way. Not trouble. Not hard times. Not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture. Nothing can separate us. They want to say, and they say they kill us in cold blood because they hate <clears throat> you. We're sitting back they pick us off one by one, and some people feel that way. And some have lost their earthly life for the Father that they've gained the eternity of their soul with the Father. They've not been separated. So even when they're coming against us and hating us, like sitting ducks, as it's just said, we continue reading, none of this phases us. Why doesn't it phase us? Because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. Wow. I don't think Shaul Paul left a stone unturned. I don't think you can come up with a thought that could say, oh, wait a minute, you didn't think about this. Oh, wait a minute, here's the way. This is a way that, that can wedge in and separate us from that love. No, no. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. So he's so secure in that. He knows that love. And yet his heart is so breaking for his beloved kinfolk. 
the Jewish people that he's saying, I, I, I could almost wish that I could be the one separated if it meant they would gain. I'm re reminded of the true story that I lived through in my college days when a young man, not yet 20, said to, to his resident assistant, who was home with him for Thanksgiving, and said, I would be willing to die if it meant my mom and dad would come to know the Lord. He didn't know that in less than two weeks, those words were prophetic. In, le in just over a week, he, healthy, everything seems fine, collapses in his dorm while he was exercising. In long story short, it ends up being a brain aneurysm. It does not take him immediately into the presence of the Lord and his unsaved dad makes the trek out across the, the, the United States madder than mad at Biola if this place has taken the last days of his son's time on earth away from him. And he came with such a chip on his shoulder, so much anger, fuming at everything this stands for, if that's what happens, that God was working a miracle. And in the almost week that it took before the Lord lovingly took John home into his presence, his dad did a complete turnaround. He was shown such love by the resident assistant, by John's own girlfriend, by the Biola students, that that love broke down the barrier that he tried to put up between himself and God. Love won him over. He heard them tell us every chapel, the update on his son. And the one day when they told us the medical bills are mounting, if any of you want to give, there'll be a bucket on the piano. We met in the gym. There'd be a bucket on the one end of the piano. Uh, you could drop in there if you want. Well, now, number one, the doors out were on the opposite side. And number two, John's dad thought, these are college kids. I know how hard it was for my son to get his money together. They don't have anything. If they got two diamonds to put together, they're buying a book or something for school. And he was amazed when he saw kid after kid cross over the opposite way to put whatever we could into that bucket because we cared about John and his family and the medical needs. As it moves on, they're literally in his hospital room, the resident assistant, John's dad, his girlfriend, and John. And in the presence where I believe God let John hear, the resident assistant was given opportunity to lay out the gospel, and John's dad accepted the Lord. He comes to, to our gym that next morning for chapel. He walks up to the, the podium, and 2,000 plus kids go dead quiet. You could have heard a pin drop in that gym. We all saw, we all knew that something was different just as he walked up. And then he stood there and he pulled out a piece of paper and said, forgive me for reading, but I'm not good at public speaking. And he shared with us how he opened his heart to Jesus to be his savior the day before. And 2,000 kids went berserk. The roof came off the gym, heaven heard our glory and joined in it with us. John went home, a day or two later, went home to heaven. We get word back. At, and they had a religious background, that's all I will say, at the ceremony that fit the religious background. His mom were, walked up to the leader of that religion and said, I want you to know I'm okay. I want you to know it's okay because I know John's in heaven and I will see him again because I've asked Jesus into my heart. Mom and dad came to the Lord because of the love that John expressed. God took him at his word. He got the glory of heaven. Mm -hmm. But his parents found the Lord too. And I don't know how many others, because the stories went on, kids who shared it with other kids, who took it to their Sunday school classes, who led kids to the Lord. It went on and on. John's got a great reward. Can't wait to see him one day again. This is the love. This is what Paul is sharing also. Paul was saying what John said, I'd be willing to die if it meant the salvation of my people. That's where he was at. That's what he's saying, and he makes it very clear because I guess I stopped short of reading it, but he could wish 
himself under God's curse, separated from the Messiah, if it would help my brothers, my own flesh and blood. Now, he doesn't mean just the man. That, that's a, can, a word that, you know, is ex not exclusive. You know what I'm trying to say. And by the way, if you have the old-fashioned accursed word in your Bible, that means God's curse. Uh, it would be separated unto perdition, separated to go into hell forever. That's why I don't know that I could say that, that I was willing to go mm -hmm. to hell for someone else's salvation. I'm willing to give my life here on earth. That's fine. But I don't. I don't think I can say I'd be willing to give up my own salvation. I think that's a love that, that's even greater. I want to read for you someone else who had that kind of love. If you don't want to look at it, you can just wait. I'll read it for you. But if you want to look, it's a book called Shmot. That's Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 to 33. This is after the golden calf has been made. This is when God's anger has been so kindled at the Jewish people because of their disobedience and their worshiping a, a golden calf that they made and saying this brought them out of Egypt and God says to Moshe I'm, I'll wipe them out and I'll raise you up a new people and Moshe answers and he says and again I'll complete Jewish Bible Moshe went back to Adonai the Lord and said please these people have committed a terrible sin they've made themselves a God out of gold he didn't deny it but then he says now if you will just forgive their sin but if you won't, then I beg you, blot me out of your book, which you've written, that book of life. Adonai answered Moshe, those who have sinned against me are the ones I'll blot out of my book. Now go and lead the people, and he goes on. He's telling him, okay, I won't wipe out everyone. Moshe stood in that gap. Our Messiah stands in that gap. He is willing and did give his life that we might not come under the curse of God. This is the kind of love that we're talking about. This is amazing love. And Paul had it for his own people, his own brothers, his own flesh and blood. If that doesn't convince you, then he says the people of Israel. Or in our New American, it says who are Israelites. Who are the Israelites? Who are the people of Israel? Who is he talking about? Being Jewish, he grew up knowing that there is what is called the Commonwealth of Israel. The commonwealth of Israel is the people of Israel who are in this commonwealth. They are a people that do have privileges. They also have a vocation. They have an assignment. But they are in this commonwealth heir to promises. God has promised them the promised land. God has promised them a number of things. Let me back up before I tell you the promises to tell you that an Israelite meant a member of the theocracy. That, in other words, means that they were part of the power of God is speaking of the nation's unique relationship to God as sovereign and it links them all the way back to Yaakov to Jacob to the promises that God gave to the fathers anytime you read that God promised to the fathers God said it to the fathers as Abraham Isaac and Jacob Abraham Yisrael, and Yaakov so as they realize and they're taught that they are part of this commonwealth of Israel, then these promises are for Israel, for the nation as a whole. This is what we're saying now, that they would have these certain special privileges, one of which was a promised land and Messiah sitting on the throne in that land. They have yet to see fulfillment of that, but by being in that commonwealth of Israel, they know that that's their future, that that belongs to them. That's why when we get down the road and we get to the book of Hebrews being written, the Hebrew people were now being kicked out of the synagogue because they were not doing the sacrificial system. Messiah had been, had come, had died, had raised. They knew he was the Passover lamb. They knew that it, this was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So they were keeping their prayer times and they were keeping festivals, but they were not keeping the sacrifices. They didn't need to make sacrifices anymore. The blood of bulls and goats, the blood of the, the sheep was lesser than the blood of Messiah. And everything was fine for a while, and then it got to the point that the leaders of the synagogue didn't like them saying, you don't have to do this. And it, they basically laid down the law. You're either going to make the sacrifices or you're out. Well, they couldn't make the sacrifices because that would be saying that Yeshua Jesus wasn't enough. And so they were being cast out of the synagogue. The synagogue, remember the temple, and I should call it a temple because that's what it was then. 
the temple was where God would meet with them. It's where the Shekinah glory of God had dwelt all the way back even in the wilderness. This was their meeting place. This to them was their safety net that they're in the midst of where God is and what he's promising. So when they felt they were being kicked out, now they're going to miss out on all the promises of God. And they began to wonder because they didn't have a Bible to pick up. They didn't have the whole complete story to read and study from beginning to end. They didn't have a ton of teachers like we have. Many right here, all the different authors, they didn't know and understand. And all of a sudden they thought, did we miss it? Did we get something wrong? Because we're certainly out here in left field now. And if God comes back to Israel, we're out. We're not going to be in on those promises. And it rocked their boat. So the author of Hebrews, whom I personally believe is Sha'ol Paul, wrote to assure them, no, 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 no. You haven't missed. Don't turn back to the law. You've got something greater. Don't turn back to the blood of bulls and goats. You've got something greater. Remember the key word for the book of Hebrews is... Better. Good for you, Pam. A plus. Better, better, better. So what they, they are being reassured all the way through the book of Hebrews is cling to the Lord. Go for, further with Him. Go far with your Messiah. You have not missed out. Furthermore, you're the one who will receive the promises. And we're going to see that there are dear Gentiles who will receive those promises also. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We've got to get a ways down these three chapters before I can hit on that point. Who are the ones that threw them out, told them that they, was that the, uh, the leaders. Jews? The or? leaders. The, yeah, it would be the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, it would be the extreme leaders the extreme of, of leaders the day. extreme leaders that are yeah. orthodox. Yes, the orthodox leaders. We're throwing out thinking the, the Jews that knew that, that were, Jesus' blood was enough. Yes. But they were saying it wasn't enough. Right, right. Okay. They, were, they felt they had to cling to that sacrificial system. And okay. the others were saying, no, let go of that. You don't have to cling to that anymore. You've got the better. You've got the permanent. Remember, they had to do it year after year after year. Right. Now it's once and for all. Okay? okay, so that's the difference. And now they're being called, and I think I opened my Bible to a new place, but let me go back. I think it's here in, um, uh, let's see. Okay, I've got to go back into my, let me go into the New American Standard for it. I've, I've discussed who are Israelites, it's Jewish people, Jewish heritage. It's not something you either are born it or you're not. It's not something you can choose and you can make yourself. You either were born an Israelite or you were born a Gentile. So it's for who, um, okay, okay, so let me give you our whole thought. He wished he could be accursed, separated from Messiah for the sake of his, his kinfolk, according to the flesh. He's talking about his fleshly, being Jewish, okay? To those who are Israelites, we made that clear now. To whom belongs the adoption as sons and daughters, okay? Adoption. Adoption is a very special word. Adoption means that they were made God's children. When you're adopted, that's a point in time when something has happened. We know that God called Israel his son. Let me read that to you in Exodus chapter 4 and verse 22. We read in that verse, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. And this is God instructing Moshe how to speak to Pharaoh. Israel is my son, my firstborn. That's Exodus Shmot chapter 4 and verse 22. Another verse where Israel is called God's son is Hosea. Hosea in Hebrew chapter 11 and verse 1 where we read when Israel was a youth I loved him out of Egypt I called my son where where did the Israelites come from they came out of Egypt crossed through the wilderness took them 40 years but finally into the promised land under Yahshua Joshua the leader that followed Moshe so we know that Israel is called his son but we're hearing here an adoption to whom belongs the adoption as sons and daughters. Now, if you know Roman culture at this time, adoption was huge. Adoption was the way that they were able to pass down to their son when they didn't have a son. Or, or maybe the son was too young. Israel would put young kings on the throne. We see that in their history, but Rome would not. Rome had to be an adult ready to take on the position. So if they didn't have someone, they would adopt someone to be their son to, to receive all of the family um, heritage, whatever is being passed down, so it wouldn't be lost. 
But the interesting thing in Roman culture is that adopted child who comes in and becomes the adopted son is 100% equal with a, a birth son. That, that one becomes joint heir. Everything that belongs to the family belongs to that adopted son. No holes barred. So when we become adopted as sons with God, everything, we're joint heirs to everything. Remember how Yeshua said we are joint heirs with Christ. And actually that was Romans 8 again, just a chapter before us that's telling us that we are joint heirs. And I love the fact, and any of you who have any kind of background with lawyers, do you hear the key word there? We're not just called heirs, but joint heirs. Anyone know what makes the difference? I love this if you don't know it. Joint I heirs. love this. Joint heir versus an heir. If you have <clears throat> heirs and you're passing down to your heirs, you split everything. If you've got four heirs, they get 25%. But if they're joint heirs, every son, every everyone, all four of those, are all 100% holders of whatever it is. So when we are joint heirs, we all get it all. It's not split up. If God's got a million sons, you don't get one millionth of the promise. You get the whole promise. And so does every other joint heir rel relative, whatever I should say. Whatever I should say. Isn't that cool? I love it. This is, this is the, the distinction of every word in the Bible. This is why I go through verse by verse and pull it apart. Because if you just miss the word joint, you miss out on that blessing. There's so much in the Word of God. And hallelujah, we are joint heirs with Him. Okay, back on track. So to whom belongs the adoptions of sons and daughters? He even opens it up. Girls, no worries. <laughs> it even says it right there. Okay? Um, so to whom belongs the adoption? Okay, what belongs to us? Now, remember he's talking to his Jewish people. They're the ones that are joint heirs with him, and there are certain things that were for the Jewish people. The first thing he hits right off the top, and I want to read it in my complete Jewish, is the Shekhinah. What is the Shekhinah? The Shekhinah, you know, to be the glory of God. Remember, the Shekhinah glory would fill the temple. It would fill the place of the Holy of Holies. It was so bright that they had to come in with incense to be the smoke screen to keep from blinding them. The Shekhinah glory was so bright that Moshe could only see what was left behind. And even that put his face to shine. It's amazing. And that's when he's hit, hidden in the cleft of the rock as that passes by also. Amazing. And as we studied the gospel and the stars, we learned from the very beginning the heavens declare the glory of God. The Shekhinah glory. The heavens declare Yeshua. So the Shekhinah is in essence saying, Yeshua belongs to you. He is your Messiah. He is the glory of God. You get it all. You're joint heirs with him. You come into this relationship with the Father of Heaven, the Creator. This is amazing. The Shekhinah was the visible glory, the luminous appearance of the Divine. This was the Divine Presence. When they followed the cloud, the pillar of fire and the cloud, they knew this was God with them. That when he picked up and moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped so that they would stay in the Shekhinah, stay in the glory, stay in the presence of God. Wow, that's something special that's been promised to our Jewish people. It goes on and says also, not just the glory, but to whom belongs the covenants. There are eight covenants in Scripture. Five out of eight of the covenants, more than half has been made to Israel. Okay, let me read you just the, the five that belong to Israel. Okay, we have the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant. We read of that in Genesis 12 and verse 2. If you want to turn there, go ahead. Genesis 12 and verse 2. Genesis 12, 2 says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. 
make your name great and you shall be a blessing. We know that it goes on and even tells them that those who bless you will be blessed, those who curse you will be cursed, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. How is all the families of the earth blessed in Avraham? It's in his seed. It goes down from Avraham to Yitzhak to Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, goes all the way down to the seed, which is Messiah, who came out of those loins, who is the blessing to the entire world. That's that in a nutshell, but the covenant was made to Abraham. We read it also in Genesis 15 and verse 18. Genesis 15 and verse 18, we read, On that day the Lord Adonai made a covenant with Avram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land. Okay, I'm not going to get on my soapbox, but i got to say one sentence. Hello, world! You want to argue who Jerusalem belongs to? You want to argue who the land of Israel belongs to? Well, I'm going to put a period where God said it, and that settles it. What did we just read? To your descendants, I have given this land. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. That takes in everything called Israel today. That takes in part of Egypt. That takes in part of Iran and Iraq, part of Syria, Lebanon. That is a huge area. And God said, it belongs to the Jewish nation, to the ones that will come out of Abraham's loins. Sorry, world. But that one little schmidge in this huge world belongs to the Jew. Right. Now argue with God, I'll and I'm off my soapbox, okay? Right. <laughs> but as a good old Jewish girl, I have to go there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Let me give you Genesis 17 and verse 8. Forgive me if I'm passionate today. You should have known. As soon as I hit this topic, you got a Jewish teacher. How can I not be passionate in right. this study? I love right. teaching this. 17 and verse 8 says... Verse eight. I will give to you, he's speaking now to Yitzhak, to Isaac, I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land where you live as a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting, how long? Everlasting, everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Okay, God said, I'm giving it to Israel, I'm giving it to the Jewish people, and then God says, it's going to be everlasting. Well, when everlasting ends, then come talk to me about giving that land away. But until everlasting is ended, I don't want to hear it. Sorry. It's just the facts. And only the facts, ma'am. <laughs> okay? Mosaic um, covenant. Mosaic covenant comes from Exodus, Shemot, chapter 19. Exodus 19 and verse 5. This is the covenant that we call the law. Now then, if you will pay careful attention to what I say, keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. God is saying through Moshe to the Jewish people, if you keep the covenant called the law, then you're my people. I'm your God. I can give this to whosoever I want but I'm choosing to give it to you. Now again, go argue with God, okay? It's not Rochelle saying it. It's not anyone else saying it. It's God saying it. Argue with God. The third covenant that is in relation to Israel has a bad name for today. I don't, I don't know why they stick it with this name. I tried to find out why, and I don't know why they call it the Palestinian Covenant, but you have to understand as soon as you hear that word, do not go to the people who call themselves Palestinian today, which is a misnomer. There never was a land with a government and all that, that called Palestine. The land was called Israel. It was given the name Palestine by the Romans who took it off of the, the root word is the Philistia, Philistine, because yeah. they were Philistine. the original enemy of Israel. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that came against Israel first. So Rome resurrected that name, put that name on the land, changed yeah. Jerusalem to Aeliana Capitolina, changed mm -hmm. all kinds of names. Mm -hmm. Well, you can call a rose a daffodil as long as you want, but that rose is still a rose. Right. You can call the land of Israel Palestine as long as you want, but it's still Israel. 
and that's all there is to it. So it's not giving the rights to those people who never were a people in a nation mm -hmm. who think they have a claim to that land. They are of Arab descent and they belong to the Arab nations, but God carved out one portion and said, this is Israel. So even though it's called the Palestinian covenant, we're talking about the land. We're talking about Deuteronomy, Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 30. David and Goliath, you know, they fought, David fought the giant. Yes, he did. So yes, they've he been did. enemies all these years. All, all along, all along. But they are the most ancient and why it was a poke at Israel to call it Philistine. You know, it would be like somebody coming in. I live in San Bernardino and I hate to do it this way, but there's no other way. Let's say that Mexico came up and took over San Bernardino and then called it Mexicali. Said, no, we're going to call this Mexicali. Well, we'd be saying till the day we die, that's San Bernardino. That's right. Well, yeah. the Jewish people never die off because God saw to that. Yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 3 through 5. Then the Lord your God, Adonai, your God, your Elohim, will restore you from captivity. He's warning them through Moshe, you're going to go off into captivity, but that's not the end, Israel. That doesn't mean I'm done with you. I will restore you from captivity. I will have compassion on you. I will gather you again from all peoples where the Lord has scattered you. If any of your scattered countrymen are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you. From there he will bring you back. That means go as far away as you can from Israel. And I don't know what the farthest away is. I should have looked on a map and tried to figure it out. But I don't care if they're in the North Pole, if they're in the South Pole, if they're in Sahara Desert, if they're in San Bernardino, California, if they're in China, if they're in Timbuktu, God says, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back. When you read about the, the gathering from the four corners of the earth by the angels at the end of the tribulation to go into millennium times, that's the fulfillment of this promise. But notice he brings them back from wherever he scattered them. He brings them back where? To Israel, to that land that he promised them. Verse 5, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possess. What did Abraham possess? We read about him at the Oaks of Mamre. We read about Lot living in Sodom and Gomorrah. That's in the part of Israel. This is the land called Israel. He will give, bring them back to the land the fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. And he, God, will be good to you and make you more numerous than your fathers. You're, there's going to be more of you in the future than there already been of you in the past. That, again, is another amazing promise. Let's go to the fourth covenant that God gave to the Jewish people. This one's got a good name, Davidic Covenant. It sounds like David with an I-C on the end, Davidic. This is promising an eternal dynasty, that there will be a king on the throne. This is 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. I don't know if I'll read it all, but that gives you your whole when you read it on your own. 2 Samuel, 2 Shmuel, chapter 7, starting with verse 10, God speaking, I will establish a place for my people Israel. I will plant them so that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. So notice he's planted them somewhere and they've been disturbed there. Does that fit the land of Israel today? Oh, how many times over does that fit? Babylonian captivity, the Assyrians, the Romans, all the way down to today, we see. So yes, it fits. I'll establish the place. I'll plant them. They'll live in their own place, not be disturbed again. Nor will malicious people oppress them anymore as previously. Even from the day... Oh, I accidentally changed my chapter. You can't touch a tablet without getting yourself into trouble sometimes. Sorry. Bringing it back up. Uh, okay, I was in the middle of... <clears throat> let's see. I think I was still in 11. Yes. From, even from that day I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. This is the tabernacle, the temple, the house of the Lord. When your days are finished, you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendant after you. Okay, you all, and we know, today these people in, in Shmuel's day, in Samuel's day, they died. They're going to lay with their fathers. But long after that, he says, I will raise up your descendant after you, 
who will come from you, someone who's going to come out of the Jewish race. I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. There's that word again. Who came out of the Jewish race, who God is going to raise up and establish a kingdom on earth and put him on that throne? None other than his son. None other than Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. I will be a father to him. He will be a son to me. Remember, he is the son of God. This is in position, the highest ranking. This is not a son that is born. Remember, the child was born. The son was given. But in that rank position of firstborn, everything belongs to the firstborn. This is what God is saying. His kingdom will be established forever. I'll be a father to him. He'll be a son to me. Now, this is where it's brought down into the earthly because this is not Messiah. It says, when he does wrong, I'll discipline him with the rod of men and with, with strokes of sons of mankind. That would be like to David and to the earthly kings. If you, if you get out of line, you do wrong, I will chastise you. Yeshua Jesus never did anything wrong, so it's not speaking of him. But again, his, his, what, the throne that David established with these earthly kings that need to be correction will one day see that king sit on the throne forever who is the perfect one that's uh, verse 16 and, and you can read in between what i'm skipping your house your kingdom shall endure before me forever your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and all this vision so nathan nathan the, the prophet spoke to david Okay, so the Davidic covenant promises an eternal dynasty, that there would be a king sitting on the throne of Israel forever. And we know that will be fulfilled yet. It will be fulfilled in Yeshua. When you read and, and say the Lord's Prayer of thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's what they're talking about. The kingdom of God come on earth and it to be the ruling kingdom of all the earth. That's what it's referring to. That's the Davidic uh, covenant promise to Israel forever. Our last covenant promise to the Jewish people, the nearest and dearest to my heart of all of these, we find in Jeremiah, Yermia, chapter 31. We're going to start reading with verse 31. We're going to read after these verses that God promises never to make a full end of Israel. But here's what he says. Behold, uh, hello, don't miss it, it's important. Uh, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. That's what this one is called, the new covenant. Who's he going to make the new covenant with? Israel. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah. They were divided at this point when it's being said. Of course, we know prophetically they're brought back. But he tells them what this covenant will be like, verse 32. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the, out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Which covenant's he referring to? I just gave it to you. Which covenant did he give them when they came out of Egypt, but they broke it? The covenant called... law the covenant called law he gave them the law the law showed them here's the holy standard of god but they broke it they didn't keep the law and he's telling them i'm going to do a new covenant not like the one that your fathers broke with me even though i was faithful to them i was like a husband to them i kept my part of the bargain so a new law is the a new covenant oh, a new covenant a new covenant a new covenant Oh, covenant. Covenant. <laughs> I don't hear well with one yeah. year. Is. Covenant is a contract. I got a new covenant with Israel. Yes. And then what else well shape with that? The, 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 it's a new one. It's not like the old one that they broke. This is a new one. A covenant is a promise between two people. When you make a covenant with someone, you're shaking hands with them. You're saying, I'll keep my part and you keep your part. Well, God did that with them when he gave them the law. They broke their part, but God stayed faithful. Now he says, I'm going to give them a new covenant, something new because they didn't keep the law, something new. This new covenant is not like the old one. This new one, verse 33, this is the covenant I'll make, oh, I read that, with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. 
I will write it on their heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. They will not teach again each one of his neighbor and his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wrongdoing and their sin I will no longer remember. So it is a new law he gave them. L A W. Yeah, but I they call it, it's called law, but then he gave them another a, a law that he writes on their hearts. Okay, and it's a, a new covenant. A new he's law. he's okay. making he he called up the new contract. It's all new. And he's saying this one's not going to be external. It's not going to be written on a heart of stone. It's going to be written on the heart of flesh. I'm going to tabernacle inside of them. I'm going to be a part with them when the when it's written on their hearts. This is a covenant that will last forever. Okay? This is not like the law which pointed to God, but they broke it. This is God putting the law in their hearts, where it's eternally theirs forever. That's the new covenant promised in Yeremia. We would see Yeshua Jesus at the Passover just before his death, burial, and resurrection. Take the matzah, take the blood, the, I'm sorry, it wasn't blood, the wine that represented his blood and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is shed for the forgiveness of sin. He was tying it right into Jeremiah. He was tying it right into Exodus, where chapter 12, where the Passover lamb was established. That's what he was saying. That's the new covenant. So Israel's got great promises. Israel gets to be adopted as sons, gets to have the Shekinah glory, gets these covenants in their fulfillment. The Torah, the law which was given to Israel, it was given exclusively to Israel. In the day of the law, if someone that was non-Jewish wanted to worship the God of Israel, the only one true and living God, they had to come under the Mosaic Covenant. They had to what we call today proselyte. They had to come into Judaism. They had to keep all the law just like the Jewish people had to keep it. And that was all they could do to show that they wanted to worship the one true and living God. They came into Israel. They were brought in. They were brought into a certain place in the temple, the court of the Gentiles. They didn't get all the privileges. They couldn't become a priest serving the Lord because they were not Jewish but they were brought in to the commonwealth of Israel. And so they had to be circumcised or not? Yeah, at that time they would have had to have been circumcised. But yet they, one of the apostles said they didn't have to That's be. in the future. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, that's, that's, in that's the future. with the new covenant. With the new covenant, there's nothing external. Oh. It's internal. It's oh, circumcision. The old, the old right. In the new covenant, circumcision of the heart. Yeah. In the old covenant, circumcision of the flesh. The flesh. Yes. Yeah, big difference, big okay? Difference, yeah. In this time, they've got the temple. They've got the temple service. The priesthood, the priests to the world were Jewish. They weren't, okay, I don't want to step on toes, but I'm going to step on toes. Please understand, you know, my love is to all. They were not Roman Catholic. They were not any other religion that calls them priests. These priests in the priesthood, in the temple, Serving God had to be of the priestly line. They had to be the Levitical line. They, to be the high priest, they had to be of Aharon's line, Aaron's line. This is what he's saying. He made it specific. And the promises that were given were messianic promises. They were promises of a messianic kingdom. When Messiah would come down to earth, break the rule that is against Israel, and set up his kingdom, raise Israel up to be the head nation of the world, but that was for Israel to be his representative to the world. The same as they were to be the priesthood to the world. They were to take the message to the world. This is the one true and living God. This is how you can know him. That's what they were to do. We know they didn't do it well. We go down the line, but God we are seeing in his faithfulness did not do away with them. My time's going rapidly. I'm going to try to stay on track. Chapter 9, again, in Romans, verse 5. Okay, we've read all these promises that are there so far. Verse 5 also tells us, whose are the fathers? Okay, when we talk about the fathers, we're not talking about Gentiles. We're not talking about 
Indians or Koreans or Swedish or, or Italian. We're talking about, as soon as you say the fathers, they're Jewish, okay? From Jacob, whom? Isaac. Right. <laughs> right. Jacob, Isaac, uh, Abraham, Abraham, working our way backward, yes. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ, okay? Now, notice how that said. Um, and let me back up because maybe I didn't say it another way too. When it talks about, and if your Bible says the patriarchs, that's another name for the fathers. The patriarchs, again, are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's their ancestry. This tells you that the Jew is a physical family, not a religion. And I'll say that till the day I die. <laughs> Jew is a nationality. It is physical. It is the same thing as every other nationality. Judaism is the religion. We're not talking Judaism. We're talking physical. We're talking Jew. Okay? From whom? Out of the Jewish race. That's the source. Out of Israel. Here's your source. Out of Israel, what's going to come? The Christ. The means specific. Christ means anointed one. So out of the Jewish race will come the anointed one who anoints God. So this is one who has been anointed by God. This is a special one. This one will be according to the flesh. This one has to be Jewish. There's no other way about it. Anybody who wanted to declare themselves Messiah had to be able to show that their heritage is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If they couldn't show that, they cannot be declared the Messiah. That also gives us reason to say from 70 AD on, no one can declare anymore. We're told we're Jewish by the word of mouth being passed down. But I don't know what tribe I come from. I know what tribe I think I come from. You can find out. You can't, they don't, the only marker they know at this point is the Levitical. There is a marker for the priestly line identified in DNA. But they don't know if you come from Manashe, if you come from Don, if you come from Naphtali, if you come from the, the, the tribe, you call them Gad, it sounds like God in Hebrew, but it's G-A-D. No one can tell. Messiah had to come before 70 A.D. to have his pedigree proven that he is in the right line. He had to be of the line of David. He had to be Jewish descent. And it couldn't be just, I say I am. He had to be able to prove it, and he did prove it. We know that, that his parents, earthly parents, of course his mother carried him, but his father did not inseminate, but both still we know were Jewish. They were sent to Beit Lechem because of the rule of a Gentile who said, go back to where your family came from. And it took both Miriam and Yosef, both sides of the family came into Beit Lechem. He was of the house and the lineage of David. You want to know his Jewish pedigree? Read Matthew 1. It tells you the line of Messiah. It doesn't get any more Jewish than that. I've told you the stories of Jewish people who have taken a sneak peek at what they think is a Christian book only to find their Jewish ancestry staring them in the face. Hey, wait a minute. What are you doing with my great, 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 great granddaddy in your book? Well, could it be a Jewish yeah, book? Yeah. Could it be a continuation of the story? I love that God put it first. He didn't put Mark first. He didn't put Luke first. He didn't put John first. He put Matthew first. And Matthew wrote to a Jewish audience. I believe God had reason for that too. Again, stay on track, Rochelle. That's the source. Messiah would come from the physical family. Messiah had to be Jewish in his physical, fleshly descent. Fully God, but fully man. This is his humanity in view. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. Jesus is the name in English. He was a... Jew. Jew, thank you. <laughs> he wasn't Mormon. He wasn't anything else. He was a Jew. He also wasn't, again, and I'm not picking on anybody, but he wasn't Filipino. He wasn't 
you know, European, he wasn't, he was yeah. Jewish, okay? No Gentile. <laughs> when we look at his full name, his full name is Yeshua. Now, they would have said Ben Yosef, son of Joseph, because they didn't understand he was son of Elohim. That's how I would say it. I would say Yeshua Ben Elohim, Jesus, son of God. But they, they said that. I lost my train of thought. Oh, his, his first name is not Jesus and his last name Christ. That's what I'm trying to say to you. Everybody thinks that because we give our first and last names. Oh, so that's his first and last name. No, his family name would have been Yosef, the, the son of Joseph. And that's what the other kids in the family would have been known as. When we call him Yeshua Jesus, we're calling him by his earthly human name and we're calling him by his title. The title Christ is the Greek word, the, or Christos is the Greek, Christ is the English, in Hebrew it is Mashiach. What does it mean in Greek? What does it mean in Hebrew? The anointed one. That's what we're calling. When we say Jesus Christ, we're saying, or Yeshua HaMashiach, we are saying Jesus, the anointed one. Who anointed him? God. That's who we're saying and what we are saying. So we see he's Jewish. And we see he's deity by the very title that we use for his name. And he had no last name. No, no, they were they were of the family of, of the son of. The, they didn't use last names like we do today. Oh, no. none of them did. No, none of them did. Oh. That's not how it was passed down. And in the Orthodox tradition of today, that is still how they do it. They they still are so and so son of, and they will name the the parent. That they're son of. That's that's the, the way they came. They gave came. last names like Judas Iscariot. That was the, where he came from. That's what. Where he came from. Iscariot oh, has to do with where he came from. Name? No. <laughs> no. That was his last name. No, it's not his last name. <laughs> oh, okay. You've got Peter. We don't know the last name. It would have been Peter, son of, and whoever his parents are. I don't remember if Scripture oh, ever tells okay. us. No. Doesn't come to my mind. <laughs> yeah, Shaul. So nobody Paul. had a last name in the Bible. No, at that time they were known by the family name. Okay, the son of so-and-so. Yes, yeah, son of so-and-so. Yes. Like son of Bar Jonah? Which means son yeah. of Jonah. Right. Yeah, Bar or Ban, either one means son in Hebrew. So, yes, yeah. Um, even Bar Barabbas, it really is Bar Abbas. Abbas is an offshoot of father. That's the son of the father. That's so much of a counterfeit. Satan threw up when here's Yeshua, who is the son of the father, and here's his counterfeit, you know, that the, the murderer that they decide they want to let go free. That was his name. You call it Barabbas, but it's Barabbas, yeah. the son of, of the father. Yeah, yeah, it's Satan's it's counterfeit. It. Anyway, okay, so we see his humanity. We see his deity. He is, as it says... From whom is the anointed one, according to the flesh, according to his Jewishness, who is overall God blessed forever. What does that mean? He is over all because he is deity. If we took the time, and I'm not going to take the time because I want to get a little bit further, look up Colossians 1, start with about verse 16, go through verse 20. You know what? I'll read you real quickly just verse 18, Colossians 1, 18, but read 16 to 20. This is who he is. He's over it all. He is the instigator of it all. Verse 18, he is also the head of the body, the church. He is the <clears throat> beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. That's what is being said here. He is over all. He is first place. Why? Because Rome, uh, Colossians 1, 16 tells us he's the creator of it all. He's the source of it all. It began from him, remember? And we'll, re we'll revisit it very soon when we do Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created, but in that word in our Hebrew, in the beginning, God the Father and God the Son created the heavens and the earth. He is over it all. He is very God himself. That's what we're saying. And he's not just now. God has blessed this forever. And again, I ask you, how long is forever? Forever. And you know what I say to that? The same thing Shaul Paul said. Amen. 
Bomein in my Hebrew, so be it. That's what he has just said. He's opened up with such a disclaimer here of who this is, who these promises are, how they come through, and who fulfills them. Verse 5. Whose are the fathers? Oh, I did 5. Sorry. I don't need to back up to 5. Um, oh, by the way, amen or amen, that is a solemn declaration of the divine majesty. You hear all the time in our Orthodox people, I hear Rabbi Naki, whom I just met with, all the time, Baruch Hashem, blessed be the name. This is their stamp of approval. It is solemnly, it's like swearing by God, this is the truth. Amen. Amen. So be it. It stands. This is it. When we're saying God bless, this isn't a doxology showing praise. This is showing that he is deity. That this is the Messiah who comes to the nation of Israel is very God himself. This comes from God. It's, he is overall and he is God. So it all is his. And he gives what he's giving to the Jewish people, to the Jewish nation of Israel. Now, we're going to see not all of Israel is going to get it though. That's not what happens. You don't get it. Remember I started out in the beginning saying people think, oh yeah, they're Jewish, they got it in. Well, that's what it sounds like if I stop right here. Oh, but Rochelle, you're just saying all of Israel gets this. Well, Paul addresses that next. And he says very clearly in verse 6, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Okay, this isn't the case, he's saying. The word of God in reference to Israel hasn't failed hasn't become of no effect, isn't powerless, isn't done away with because the Jews reject it. If it were, then it'd all be over. But he's saying that's not what's happened. God's promises are not done away with. God's word is sure. God's word must be fulfilled. So, yes, we have a problem. Not all of Israel is Israel. What does he mean by that? And I think that, did I read that phrase? No, I didn't read it. That's our next phrase. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Let me read verse 7 also. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants shall be named. Now let me go back, okay? Not all Israel is Israel. All of the physical descendants, all of the people who come through out of the, 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 the being descendants, out of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... He's saying they're not all the people of God. The ones who are the people of God are going to be the spiritual ones. Israel's the national status. They're all Jewish. But now he's saying there's a section in Israel who are the ones who are Israel, who are of Israel of God. And to explain that, he says, let me go back and show you. Avraham. It's not just Avraham's descendants. But it has to come through Isaac. Well, wait a minute. Abraham had another son. He had Ishmael. If this were a blanket statement for all of Abraham's descendants, then it would go to all of Ishmael as well as all of Isaac. Ishmael, we know, represents the Arab nations. The nations that came out of Ishmael are Arab nations. God promised there would be many nations out of him also. And there are. But God said, no, the promises that are for those who we're calling now, I'll say it this way, spiritual Israel, that may not be safe later, but right now, it's not just being physically born, now it's being selective. It has to come from, I, from Abraham through Isaac. We're going to see it has to come from Isaac through one of his two sons. Isaac had two sons also. He's going to address that in a moment, so I will address it when he does. Verse 7 is we're going on, says, Nor are they all children, because they're Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants shall be named. So, Abraham, even though you have more children, the ones that are called children of Israel, we're going to get a little more specific. Now they have to come through Isaac. Isaac. Okay? If they don't come through Isaac, we're not talking about them. Then it says... For this is the word of promise. This is, did I skip? I skipped, sorry. Verse 8. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are called children of God. 
but the children of the promise are regarded as descendants. So the flesh is Ishmael and Isaac, but the children who are called the children of God, the children of the promise are through Isaac. Okay, we've gotten specific. Now verse nine, for this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah, Sarah will have a son. Remember, Abraham even tried, should be Eliezer, shall be my servant, who he could adopt in as a son and give the, the promises to. And God said, no, it will come out of your loins. And we know that Isaac was miraculously born. So we see the selection through Isaac very clearly. Okay, it's not just the seed. It starts with the seed, that's the offspring. But then there are specific ones who are promised this descendancy comes through them. In Yitzhak, okay, not through, in Isaac, not through Ishmael, the promises would be inherited. Hold your place here. I'm gonna go to Genesis 21, and I think it's verse 12. Genesis 21 and verse 12. I want to, you to see scripture backs up scripture. Genesis 21 and verse 12 says that God said to Abraham, do not be distressed because of the boy and your slave woman. That's Ishmael and Hagar. Don't be distressed because of them. Whatever Sarah, Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, Yitzhak, through her son, your descendants will be named. Okay? So Genesis 21, 12 tells us it has to be through Isaac. Now we're reading in, in Romans 9. Paul's giving him a good Jewish lesson of of the Jewish heritage, the line, the line, the heritage, okay? Abraham to Isaac. Isaac's the one who will bear his name. That's who the title will be passed down through. Now we're beginning to see that the privileges that were given to the Jewish people were not just dependent on their, their fleshly descendancy, their being Jewish in blood, but now we're beginning to see that this is the children of promise. Because what was Isaac? He was the child of promise. He was promised to Abraham, and God delivered. 25 years after God promised. Since he was God sent delivered. us, <laughs> we jumped the gun and we said that Isaac is around, and now we're fighting them forever. Yeah. yeah. Because, because he, all because of sin. Yeah, because of sin. Beware yes, but it's board. it's made very clear now that those who are going to be called the children of promise are the ones who come through the the child of, of promise, the child of faith, the one who came through faith. God promised in His faithfulness, He delivered Sarah had the son called um, Isaac. Okay, now because some of the Jewish people fail to receive the promises, it doesn't mean that they all will, okay? The way that what we're saying here is the promises are going to continue down through the believing remnant. That's very important when you get all the way down to the generation, the Jewish people that rejected Messiah when he was here in his fleshly blood, I'm talking AD 30s, around there. Just because they reject it doesn't mean all of the nation of Israel loses. The believing remnant will receive the promises. And I'll tell you that's true all the way down to today and all the way to the Millennial Kingdom. If you were with me in the study of Revelation, who goes into the Millennial Kingdom to inherit the land? Do you remember the sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25? The sheep go in and the goats are cast out. That is a picture of the believing Jews who go in and start that kingdom with Messiah sitting on the throne. The not believing are cast out. It is the children of promise, the believing remnant that received this promise and for the land, the promise is to the Jewish believing remnant, the Jewish physical descendancy. It's not promised to whosoever and it's not talking about the spiritual promises. It's talking about the earthly promise of that land, geographical land, that I described when I read Genesis 15, from the river Nile to the river Euphrates, from what's in Egypt to what's in Iraq, and all in between is what's being promised. This is earthly promises, but this is what's been promised to the Jewish people 
the ones who are of faith, the ones who believe will be the ones who will receive. The ones who don't believe will not receive. The promises go to those who believe. So no Gentiles are, are the sheep and the goat, just the Jewish right, people. Right, right. The sheep and goat judgment's talking just about the Jews. Just There's the another Jews. judgment for the Gentiles because there will be Gentiles who go into that land also. But the promise is to the Jews and for it to be their land. They will be the head nation. Other nations so will be, be on Gentiles earth. Gentiles that go in with them too, you say. Yes, they'll go into the millennial kingdom. No, but I mean Israel, the sheep and the goat. The sheep and goat is just Jewish. Just Jewish. Just All Jewish, way, no yes. Gentiles at all. Not in that parable. Not in that oh, okay. that picture, no. That picture is referring to the Jewish people. Only. Okay, only. Okay. Yeah, the, the goats are unbelieving Jews. The sheep are the believing Jews. That will go into the millennial kingdom. They will live in a land called Israel. That will be their right. Israel will be the head nation. But there will be Gentiles that go into the millennial kingdom also. They'll make up the other nations. But, but Israel will be the head sheep. nation. They're not the, the sheep. They're of another they're flock. Sheep. There's other judgments. The nation. Yeah, there are other judgments that are given to describe them. In, in I think it starts with Matthew 26. Don't quote me there, but it's, it's I think it's after, I think 25 is ended when it starts. But there are Gentile, there are Gentile um, judgments that show, you know, for the Gentiles also. Okay, so back sticking on track because we're talking about Israel. Paul's letting Israel know that there are the, the advantages of the Jews where they had the covenants, they had the glory, they had the adoption, they have the, the law, and they have the promises, including the land. These are the promises given to the Jewish people, but the ones who will receive it will be the believing ones. That's what we're seeing now as it starts to come down. All the way verse 9 makes it clear, for this is the word of promise. At this time it will come to Sarah, she will have a son. So Isaac is the son of promise. They have to be through Isaac, they have to be in, in the promise to receive. Okay, the word of promise, it would be better to say the word is one of promise. As he declares his word, he is promising. This is what they will receive. Verse 10, I'm in Romans 9, verse 10. And not only that, but there also was Rebecca, Rivka, okay? We've got Abraham, we've got Isaac. Now, Isaac was married to Rebecca. Who does Rebecca have? She's twins. She's got um, Yaakov and Esau, Jacob and Esau, in her tummy. Remember, they're warring in her tummy. That must have been some fight going on, and they're kicking, and poor Rebecca <laughs> is wondering what's happening to her. And she goes to God, and she asks him what's going on, and he tells them there's two nations that are, are uh, battling in there. But let's read it in here. Uh, verse 10, um, there's Rebecca. When she conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, okay? The promise comes through Isaac. Does that mean now it goes to both the sons, to Jacob and Esau, because they're both Isaacs? But no, God says, for though the twins were not yet born, had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand. Okay? Esau and Jacob haven't even been born yet. They've not been able to earn the promises. It's going to be freely given to who God chooses. And he's not going to choose on the basis of, you're good and you're bad, so I choose you. No, God does it solely on the basis of him. He is the one who is the promiser, the guarantor. He does it because he is unconditionally faithful, not because they ever earn it on their own. No one ever earns salvation on their own. The Jewish people don't even earn their promises on their own. It's because of God's unconditional faithfulness. And that's what he makes clear. They haven't even been born. They haven't done good or bad. So God's purpose is, is according to his choice and his choice only. It would stand not because of works, but because of him who calls. God is the one who calls. No one comes to the Father but that he calls them. It is according to his call. And then he makes it very clear. Let me make sure I told you everything I want. Um, God's got a purpose. That's a proposed action. 
He's determined to carry it through. He's going to carry it through the individual of his choice. He is the one orchestrating. This is his sovereign choice. You could say this is his elect choice. He is choosing. He is selecting. There's no other way around it. The same way he selected the Jewish people, now he's going to select within the Jewish people. And he made that very clear. It's going to stand. It's going to abide. It's not going to be by their works. Both Jacob and Esau are legitimate heirs to Isaac. They're his sons. They should be joint heirs. They should both get everything. But that isn't quite how it works in Jewish tradition. But we won't worry about that because we're talking about God's sovereignty. And he says, it's not on the basis of their works, but on the basis of the one I call. I'm going to call one of these two. The one that I call is the one who I'm going to be dealing with, who I'm going to pass those promises down to. And that's the one that, that by his sovereignty, will receive the promises. It was still in the natural line, but it was a choice. The same way God did not choose Ishmael, we know the end of the story, God did not choose Esau, he chose Jacob. He tells us that so because- what nation did Esau belong to? Arab. The Arab, Arab nations come he from Esau. He was a Jew, but he turned Arab. But uh -huh. the Arab nations come out of him, okay? Uh, but they're, Arab nation they're, comes out but of But they him. all have some, some the Jewishness continues on this way, but when you get back, they're all, they're all, let me put it this way. Isaac was an Israelite, that's what he was called. Esau would be of Israelite descendant. But so Jacob Israelite is gonna be, descendant. yeah, but Jacob's gonna be what the Jewish line is called. It's gonna come out of the word Judah. That's the, where the word Jew comes from. As it continues on down, now you've got Jewish people. You don't have Jewish people with Isaac and, uh, I mean, with Jacob and Esau yet. There's nobody called a Jew yet. But they're called Israelites. They're called Abraham's children. It continues on. Finally, you get Jew when you get down to Judah, who comes out of Jacob, one of um, his 12 sons. So what is his, his name altogether? Uh, Who's Esau. Esau. He would be of Israelite descendancy, um, but he's an Edomite, is what they call him, because he lived, he lived in the land of Edom. And out so of the just, land of Edom the land come of the Eden. Arab nations. Edom, yeah, E-D-O-M, yeah. So, the Arab nations so come he, through that So he's a Jew uh, Arab. <laughs> I mean, it's the hard Jews to and Arabs put a are name cousins. On him, you know, how the, do you label him? Yeah. The Jews and the Arabs are cousins, okay? So Does that help? They're cousins. The Jewish race, the Arab one, they're cousins. You go back far enough, they've got a, a same. So, what faith did he follow? Did he follow the Arab faith? He followed the heathen. The, uh, he followed uh, heathen. There, it would have been called heathen. Okay? Heathen, heathen yes. Because he did not stay well, by he wasn't, God's he law. He wasn't an Orthodox Jew. No. He was. He was a heathen. A heathen. He married Hittite women who worshipped other gods. He followed the ways of his wives. Oh. He didn't honor the one true and living oh God. My gosh. He knew That's the one true and living God. So I hate. <laughs> and now you're ahead of me. So let's get back Maybe on that's that track. Why you said that? <laughs> yes, in essence. But let me explain it a little more. Back mm -hmm. on track. Okay. So God's the one choosing. He doesn't choose because of the worst. He chooses the one he calls. For it was said to her, verse 12, the older will serve the younger. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The older is supposed to have that preeminence, but God said, no, the older is going to serve the younger. Esau came out of the womb first. He's the older. He's going to serve the younger. Everyone who says Jacob stole it needs to read this. God said the older is to serve the younger. He didn't steal anything. Even when you go through the story, Esau sold it to him. When his father went to bless him, he should have said, Dad, I gave it to my brother. I bought it for a bowl of lentil soup. Bottom line, it was a stupid step, but I did it. I got to live by my consequences. And of course he didn't. I don't think, even when he said, yeah, I'll give you my birthright, I don't think he believed it. I think he figured I got it in with Dad and I'll see to it. Dad blesses me, gives me the birthright. That he had his comeuppance. But regardless, it's because God said it. God said, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written. 
And this is a hard verse for people to understand. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, does that mean that God literally hated Esau and condemned him to hell? No. It's a Hebrew idiom. The, the Hebrew idiom is, I've got such a love for Yaakov, for Jacob, because he's got a heart for me. Jacob had that godly heart. He wanted to learn about God. He wanted to follow God. He wanted to be obedient to God. Did he live perfect? No. But this was his heart. Esau was a man of the field. He was a hunter. He was out in the wilds. He was shooting animals when Jacob was studying that God created the animals. Okay? See the difference in their hearts? Well, God so loved that heart of Jacob that if you compared and contrasted, it looked like he hated Esau's heart. That's what it's saying. It's a comparison contrast idiom. It's not meaning that he literally hated Esau. He loves the world. He died for the world. His blood was shed for Esau, not just for Jacob. But the love for Jacob's heart made it look like he had a hatred for, for Esau. Two extremes. He, one is so hot, it makes the other one cold. Okay, now, verse 14 will hit on a problem then. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? Because as soon as people read this, they say, that's not fair. I'm of Esau and I don't get the blessings. I don't get these promises. That's not fair. God, you're not fair. You chose and I get no say. So Paul addresses that before they can open their mouths and start complaining. And he says, is there any injustice with God? Can God seemingly just make an arbitrary selection apart from human action and say, I'm going to save you and I'm going to send you to hell? Is that what God does? If that's true, then what happens to John 3:16 that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So obviously that's not what scripture is saying and Paul makes that very clear. He says, God forbid, far from it. No way, Jose, get that thought out of your mind. Send it to the pit of hell. That's where it belongs. Our God is not that way. Let's read what he explains. There is no injustice with God then. Verse 15, for he says to Moshe, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy. I will show compassion on whomever I show compassion. So then it doesn't depend on the person who wants it, nor the one who runs, but on God who has the mercy. So Paul's answer is rather than unrighteousness, God's mercy is manifested in his sovereign election. His mercy chose Jacob. Marvel that he had mercy on anybody. Jacob didn't deserve it. He wasn't even born yet, remember? He hadn't been, had a chance to do good or evil. Esau didn't lose it because of how he was. God chose to extend mercy. It's a marvel, it's amazing that he chooses to give mercy to any of us. Look at Exodus 33. Uh oh, oh well, I'll get back to Romans. Exodus chapter 33. Verse 19, Exodus 33 and verse 19, we read, And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and show compassion to whom I will show compassion. This is God speaking to Moshe just before he let him see that which remains behind. What we're seeing is God does choose to pour out his mercy, and thank God that he does. Let me take you back to Romans by way of Psalms. Go to Psalm 103 and verse 11. Psalm 103 and verse 11. Remember, none of us deserve anything from God, that we're thankful he exudes his mercy. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. God does extend his mercy. It's the extent of his mercy. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Mercy is not being sent to hell because that's what we deserve. 
Grace is the flip side. If I've got a coin with heads and tails and the head says mercy, then the tail says grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We get Yeshua's blood put in our place. We get the free gift of salvation. Mercy is not getting what we deserve, condemnation. Grace is getting what we don't deserve, the free gift of salvation. In his compassion toward humans, he chose a vessel to show mercy on that we might know and understand we too can receive the mercy, the compassion of our God. Let me take you also to Psalm 78 and verse 38. Psalm 78 and verse 38. In Psalm 78 verse 38 we read, But he, God, being compassionate, forgave their wrongdoing and did not destroy them. And often he restrained his anger and did not stir up all his wrath. And I stand here and say, thank you, God. You didn't give me what I deserve. You are compassionate. You are not pouring out your wrath on me. You're not stirring up your anger. You're giving me your compassion. That we all just need to be on our knees and say thank you. It's not because we deserve it. Second Peter, Second Kepha, chapter three and verse nine. Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine. We read, the, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Second Peter nine. One. Three nine. Second Peter three nine. When you say to the Lord, this world is so evil, why don't you hurry up and come? You promised to take us out of this. It's long overdue, Lord. Why don't you hurry up and come? This is the answer. The Lord is not slack toward that promise. He is going to do it. But he says, I'm slow about fulfilling it because in this interim, more will come to me. More will come to repentance. More will be saved. I think of that so many times when I want to get impatient, and I do, and I still say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But then I think of a soul that isn't saved. Okay, Lord, wait another day that this one might get saved. That's his compassion. That's his mercy. That's what he's telling us, that not because we deserve it, but he does exude his mercy. He does choose to show it. The fact he chooses it is amazing. Jacob didn't deserve it, God chose him. Esau didn't do anything to not deserve it, but God didn't chose him, choose him. Now, I believe that that is on the basis, of, if we read Romans in the beginning, according to his foreknowledge, he chose. He knew the hearts, and he chose the hearts. Every heart that he knew would turn to him, he chose, so that no one will stand before God wishing Oh, I wanted to, but you didn't let me go. No, no. God so loved the world. Any who want, God gives them his mercy. Okay? So, uh, oh, my word is 345. <laughs> wow. Okay, next week I got to talk faster. You got to listen faster. Okay, let me see where I can tie this up um, because I don't want to leave it in the midst of the thought. Let, let's finish through 18. I think that's where it'll break the thought real quickly. He's given mercy to who he wants, compassion who he wants. So then it does not depend on the person who wants it, nor the one who runs, but on God who has mercy. It's not up to what the person does. For the scripture says, verse 17, to Pharaoh, the very reason I raised you up in order to demonstrate my power in you, that my name might be proclaimed throughout the earth. He raised Pharaoh up into that position of rulership because he knew through Pharaoh the world would see his power. He caused Pharaoh to stand in that position. He brought him onto the stage of events. We read about this in Exodus 9 and verse 16. Let me read it for you real fast. I really am almost done. I don't have much to say for, for here to the end. Exodus 9 and verse 16 says, But indeed for this reason... I've allowed you to remain. I've allowed you, Pharaoh, to be in power in order to show you my power 
in order to proclaim my name throughout the earth. And here that's what Paul is alluding to here, that when God makes these choices, it is to show his power. He is acting in the stage of our lives so that his name is proclaimed throughout the earth. Verse 18, so then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. I'll probably re-emphasize re this next week too because this is another tricky point for people to understand. First of all, he shows his power. We understand that. He demonstrated his power through the plagues. God has the ability to even use the enemies of Israel to show his glory. Through the enemy called Pharaoh, God showed his glory and his power through the plagues and all that was done. It's his will. It's God. what God wants. It's his desire. He works it out and he uses the enemies of God and he uses the people of God. Okay, through their, the enemies, through Pharaoh's foolhardiness, through his insensibility to realize he was in danger, that he was coming up against the very God of creation, through his obstinacy, God's power would be revealed. In Exodus, we read about the hardening, and it's represented, and here's what I'll pick up next week, it's represented by Pharaoh producing it himself and by God producing it. And here again, people will say, that's not fair, God. I've got a bone to pick with you. <laughs> well, let me tell you just real fast in closing. If you have a blob of wax and you have a blob of clay and you put both in the sunlight, what happens? One melts and one hardens. How did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He gave him the light of himself. He gave him the truth. Yes. Pharaoh's heart hardened in it. The one who comes to saving faith melts in it. That's how God hardens our heart. Not that he says, you don't have a choice and I'm going to send you to hell. No, I'm going to give you the light. I'm going to show you the choice and you're going to, because of your makeup and who you are, you're going to clench your fist at it. You're going to harden your heart against it. Then when you go to hell, you have no one to blame but yourself because you hardened your heart against the mercy of God. See the difference? So this is what Paul is saying. He's bringing it through. God shows his power. I will again um, revisit this and tell you a little bit more from the Hebrew that we're going to see that no one stands before the Lord out of injustice. No one stands before the Lord and says, well, I wasn't chosen Jewish. I was born Gentile. I was even born Arab. I wasn't even just born Italian or, or, or whatever. I was born Arab. I was born one of those that, that came against your people. That's not fair, God. And God will show in his mercy that, that it was open to all. He chooses because he gives mercy to whosoever. Not to to lock people out, but to bring people in. You know, we've got to look at it that there's two sides. The glass is half full or is half empty. With God, it is half full. It is not half empty. It is not going against. It's a marvel and amazement that any come in to saving faith, and it's not because of their earning it. It's because he freely gives it. Okay. We'll pick up here next week. We'll try to move a little faster. I thought I'd get a little was further. Was this a lesson on the rainbow? <laughs> no, that was last I week. Think so. That was last week. So this was. Not gonna do the rainbow anymore. I did it all last week. All oh, your we're finished. We're finished with well, the rainbow. Well, we weren't here last week. The week before. The week before okay. That. The week that before. That was the ending of the rainbow. I we did the whole. I these notes under the rainbow titles. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, okay. The okay. the rainbow was last time. It was a complete study. Oh. This study is Romans 9, 10, and 11. We should do it in three weeks. It's not necessarily a chapter a week. Obviously, we'll see that we pick up speed at some of these other areas. Laying down the foundation always takes longer. So we've laid down our foundation. We're building on it now. I don't know where we'll stop next week, but by the end of the third week, I expect to be at the end of, Ro of Romans 11. So, so Romans is our lesson. Yes, Romans and 9, 10, and, and 11. Genesis we get in September. Right. September what? 15th, September 15th. 15th. Okay. Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel passed. That's where we are right now. We're looking at Israel past. When we hit chapter 10, we'll look at Israel today, present. When we get to chapter 11, we'll look at what's Israel's future.
That affects all of us because Israel is God's time clock to fulfill his promises. That tells us where we're at, what we can expect, so it affects us whether we are Jewish or whether we are Gentile. You're not left out. Remember, he didn't exclude. He didn't choose and say, forget you Gentiles. He formed you out of the dust of the earth in the image of himself. He loves you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He doesn't say, that's just if you're Jewish. No, no. Okay, we'll pick it up. I'm sorry, I'm so long past. I literally lost track of time. Somebody needed to red flag me and say, hey, do you know 3.30 past? Um, and especially today, because Josie's got something she wants to share. But I think the people you want are still there. I'm looking, um, we might have to get to Rowena. Oh no, Rowena's still there, she moved. You were over here, now you're over here on my screen. Kiss Betty came in. <laughs> Kiss Betty came in. Okay. All right. Let me close in prayer fast. Then, Dosi, share your praise. Lord God, we thank you that you do choose us, that you love us, that each one of us who knows you is because you drew us to yourself, not because we earned it, not because we were so smart, not because we were born in the right family or lineage or place on the face of this earth. It is solely because of you being faithful, because of you being God, because of you being sovereign, and because of your will. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. May we walk in your love and know it and be so excited in it that we've got to share it with those around us that in this time that you are waiting, one more will be saved. One more. One more. Lord, let us reach them with the truth of your love. Thank you that it is a love that sets us free for all eternity. Thank you for the promises, sure, because you are the God who is faithful, who keeps his promises to the thousandth generation and then some. In your holy name, we praise you and we give thanks. Amen. Amen.